Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello, Ava. Ava just woke up. Hi. <laughs> okay, today's Thursday, September 5. Right, Ava? Hi. Okay. Gospel for today comes from St. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. By the way, today is the, uh, the death anniversary of St. Um, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so today is the day that, that she went home to heaven. God called her back home to heaven today. Okay, so oh, bless you. We can especially remember Mother Teresa today. Okay, so this is a long gospel. Let's try to uh, go through it. While the crowds were pressing in on Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats along the lake. The fishermen had disembarked and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, he asked him to put out a short distance from the shore. Then sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. That image, just to say, this is not what I'm exactly going to deal with today, but it just popped up in my head. That image of our Lord preaching in a boat by the Lake of Gennesaret is, is an image that's being used for the church. Okay? That the church is like uh, the boat of Peter. Okay? And the boat of Peter where our Lord is preaching his his uh, uh, the, the imagery is very rich in that kind of uh, uh, presentation of the church being like the boat of Peter right? where our Lord uh, uses the boat of Peter like his pulpit where he preaches to the crowds and the ocean being the uh, the background of it it's like uh, saying that you know this message is for the entire world this message is for the vastness of this ocean is for everybody right and that uh, on this boat we can go everywhere that the church is going to be universal the church is going to be everywhere the church will go to the entire world okay and uh, that's that's the image the boat of peter so it's a very very powerful imagery and very poetic at the same time see sophia you're studying poetry uh this semester so these are some you know images that are very poetic anyway then, after he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. This is also part of the boat of Peter image where, you know, uh, our Lord says, You will catch men. Right? But that's going to come later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Simon said in reply, So imagine here, our Lord tells him, Go lower your nets for a catch after he had preached, right? And then Simon must have looked at him and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But at your command, I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were tearing. This, this thing never ceases to amaze me. Right? Imagine the humility of St. Peter. He, the skillful fisherman, he has grown old in the lake of Gennesaret, fishing all his life. Right? Uh, a skill that he inherited, must have inherited from his own father. The whole village was a village of fishermen. They knew their craft. They knew their trade. They knew what they were doing. They knew what it meant toiling all night, catching nothing. <clears throat> they knew the conditions of that lake. They must, have, they must have memorized even the patterns of how the fish behave in that lake. And they tried the whole night as fishermen do. They don't fish during the day, right? There's a reason for that because 
they need to attract uh, uh, fish and they uh, they make use of little lights that attract the fish to the surface so you can't fish in the morning this is already morning he was already preaching to the crowds yet he tells Peter ah, lower your nets for a catch okay? so Peter must have scratched his head and said what's this carpenter telling me to do I am the the best fisherman around here. Why do I have to listen to a carpenter who knows nothing about fishing and tells me, lower your nets for a catch? But look at the disposition of St. Peter. He says, Master, we have worked all night and have caught nothing. Yet, at your command, I will lower the nets. St. Peter demonstrates great humility in obeying the command of our Lord. Humility is the precursor, so to speak, of obedience. Obedience hangs on the virtue of humility. Proud people don't know how to obey. And that's the story of pride. That's the story of disobedience all the way from Adam and Eve. Right? All the way from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were so proud to obey a very simple command of our Lord. Do not touch the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. Right? And that is what cost us the great misfortune of original sin which of course is also a happy fault in the sense that without original sin there'll be no salvation there'll be no revelation there'll be no uh, cross right but that's beside the point the point we want to make here is that in order to obey we need to be humble so that is why it's very easy to see Every time you find a disobedient person, okay, or a disobedient child, you already know that that person, that child, is full of pride. Full of pride. Because a proud person cannot obey. Cannot obey. And pride is a very, very bad sin. Pride is a very, very bad tendency. And really, if you're full of pride, you can go too far in the realm of virtue. Okay? Because every other virtue is going to be difficult for you to fulfill if you are proud. But most especially, the virtue of obedience. So what does St. Peter demonstrate here? He shows us the prerequisite for obedience. We have to be humble. We have to be humble. And we have to trust authority. We have to trust the people who make us obey. Because what is obedience? Obedience is the submission of your own will to the will of another. To the will of somebody who is superior to you. To the will of somebody who has command over you. To the will of somebody who has authority over you. And who, who are these people we're talking about? Well, number one, you begin from your own home, right? Your parents, right? Your older siblings, perhaps. And as you go out of the home, then there are other people you are subject to. There are other people who have authority over us. There are other people who have command over us. Okay? And that is not a bad thing. That is just all part of the fabric and network of human structures that are all um, uh, an image of the relationship that we should have and that we do have between us and our Father God. Right? All human authority on earth is nothing but a mirror of our own divine filiation. Of our own sonship with God who is our father so this obedience to your parents 
and to every authority on earth that have uh, authority over you is disobedience to God. Because your parents and people in authority over us are representatives, stand-ins for God's authority over us. So let us learn to be obedient. Let us learn to trust. Okay? Let us learn to trust people in authority. Let us learn to trust our parents. Because even if at times we think that our parents don't know what they're telling us or they don't know what they're saying, even if, if, if it may appear that way to us, rest assured, they are never wrong. And rest assured, when you obey, you will never be wrong. Because sometimes you don't know that your parents are making you do things because they have another underlying motive of why they want you to do what they're making you do. Which perhaps at that point when they are telling you these things, you still do not understand. And you, can, you cannot make sense of, why is he making me do this? What for? When that other way is easier or this other way is better. Or at least you thought, like, like St. Peter did, right? We have toiled all night. Why are you going to make me lower the nets now? Right? Or in another case, when Jesus already resurrected and he, the same story happened, he found him in the lake, right? And said, have you caught any fish? And then they said, no, we have toiled all night. Okay, cast your net to the right side, he said, right? To the right side. Right side? What, make, what difference does that make, left or right? They could have complained like that, right? Same thing with you. Many times, you complain like that. Why do I have to do it this way? Why not the other way? Is this thing, I think this is better. Nah, trust. Trust the one who is telling you to do things. Trust the one in authority. That's part of your humility. The humility you need to obey. Okay? Instead of fighting authority, trust, be humble, and obey. Because you never know, there might be other reasons why he's asking you to do why those in authority are asking you to do why, uh, what they're making you do this way or the other. So before we rebel, before we, we go against authority, before we despise obedience, let us put our humility in check. Rather, let's put our pride in check. Okay? And first ask ourselves okay where is my humility here maybe i can try to put a little practice humility a little bit better and you know i like a military uh, there's there's a military saying in the military establishment which goes like this obey first before you complain that is something that when i was in the military training something that they drummed up in our heads all the time obey first before you complain that is the kind of obedience that's required of, of soldiers. Okay? And that's actually the kind of obedience that should be required of everybody. Obey first before you complain. That way, you'll realize later on, you have no reason to complain after all. Okay? So let's all be soldiers. Let us all act like soldiers of Christ who want to grow in this virtue humility and obedience so before you complain next time around remember you are a soldier of christ and act like a soldier obey first before you complain okay bye bye everybody see you again tomorrow have a good day bye, -bye. bye, -bye.